Okay, well, welcome to the last uh, lecture for class, um, LGBTQIA and Disability Grief. Um, this lecture is about Sarah Ahmed's chapter, uh, Queer Feelings. Um, so she, and what I really like about this uh, article is that it just raises up to the level of consciousness some of the un implicit biases and um, unconscious patterns that we carry around with us. Um, Maybe even the fact that I've kind of consigned um, this topic to a particular week uh, fairly late in the semester might raise your, raise your awareness of the issue of a kind of silence grief. Um, what students I've found really appreciate about Sarah Ahmed's work is how she allows for a kind of mourning um, that comes along with compulsory heterosexuality in our culture. So um, they've appreciated the chance to kind of see that as a form of disenfranchised grief, and then uh, the opportunity to reflect on it. Um, and so I think this is changing, and it might be changing even since Sarah Ahmed has written this uh, helpful piece. Um, I was thinking about a, a children's book that we like at our house called Princess, Princess Ever After, uh, which is by Katie Day, which is a lovely um, fair, retelling of a fairy tale where there's two princesses, and the princesses rescue the prince instead of the, the other way around. Um, so, uh, again, following with some of the other readings we've had, uh, we're kind of raising to the surface some of our implicit biases and norms. Um, and Sarah Ahmed, I think, is a good uh, person to lead us through that. Um, she asks us, and these are great questions for the field of pastoral care. She asks us, um, how do we feel... Uh, what do we feel like we're protecting when we're defending the family? And she says that family life often becomes uh, a, a form of social life that's threatened by outsiders. And people talk about families this way as needing protection. Um, <coughs> but then she says that kind of heterosexual people in uh, monogamous families then uh, are part of a dominant narrative that where the others... Uh, gays and lesbians become a, a form of fascination. Um, she says there's kind of a, a fear of wrongful coupling. And she talks about how these, these scripts for desire tend to shape our bodies and lives. She's influenced by uh, people like Michelle Foucault and Judith Butler, who talk about the norms that are in place that kind of, uh, like uh, the signs on the bathroom door that shape our experience of the world. And they, they give us implicit messages for who we need to be. She calls uh, orientation is really a forceful act. She says orientation is a way that some bodies are directed towards others. And uh, she talks about what happens when the, there's a failure to orient towards uh, ideal sexual bodies. So um, in terms of loss and grief class, Sarah Ahmed does a really nice job how, describing how um, for some time, there's been a psychic cost to loving the unlovable subject. So uh, gays and lesbians, because their loves have been deemed unlovable, have uh, paid a psychic price. Um, and that's been through kind of, uh, through their loves and desires being deemed shameful by, by the larger society. Um, So um, there's a kind of compulsory heteronormativity that she talks about as being taken for granted. And it comes out in our conversation sometimes of, uh, do you have a boyfriend or girlfriend? Um, she talks about the various ways in which people are, are um, in being invited to pass and mistaken for hetero and how that gives a kind of power. But retreat, repeated over time, that constitutes a kind of bodily injury as people deny parts of themselves and shut off parts of themselves. Um, and what it does, too, is it makes everybody invested in a myth of uh, kind of heteronormative love, that uh, hetero love is the only way that love happens. Uh, this is, creates a kind of uh, easiness or a, a casualness to our expressions, but um, it also makes certain people uncomfortable when they don't fit into that desire. Um, so a comfort is about a fit between your desire and your environment. And anything less than that comfort is a, is a form of loss, I would say. 
a kind of a loss of ease, a loss of, of being able to express yourself, a kind of out of shapeness or estrangement is what Ahmed calls it. Um, so she, she wonders why queer folks are being asked so often to make heterosexuals uh, more comfortable by not uh, having public displays of affection. But the other is not true. Um, so p people who are gay don't have a right to ask heterosexuals not to express themselves in public displays of affection. So there's an imbalance of power, um, and there's kind of ways in which people uh, uh, are being constricted into certain uh, forms of legitimate and illegitimate loves. Uh, and those those forms of uh, legitimate and illegitimate loves, you should be thinking in terms of the class as a whole and the notion of kind of a disenfranchised grief here. Um, and so if you're formed into these legitimate or illegitimate loves, you might internalize a sense of shame or less self-worth, uh, and you might deny parts of yourself. Uh, Judith Butler talks about the social and psychic costs of not having one's relationship recognized by others. And these are enormous, especially in situations of loss where you're already kind of vulnerable uh, to touch back on the topic of, Sh of Sharon Kowalski from the previous lecture. Uh, so she talks about how queer life is a form of discomfort with scripts of normative existence. This Maybe is this is less the case now than when she wrote this, but I think it's still the case as well. Um, she talks about intersectionality, uh, queer lesbians in South India, um, She's a dark, dark-skinned person, has been left out of a lot of conversations between gays and lesbians because of a, a racism in that community. Um, and so there's a question, what does freedom uh, mean for people who aren't all free in the same, same way? Um, and another question that's raised by this article is, is it possible for straight folks to live a queer life? Uh, so discomfort is when there isn't a space for some bodies. Um, so some working class lesbian parents, for example, uh, can be uh, placed outside of their family kin networks because of not, not be, their love not being recognized. And she argues that a family, instead of being a noun, should be considered a verb, a doing, a set of practices, a word for doing. So family is a way of familying each other, regardless of... Uh, the biological nature of our relationships or uh, what, uh, whether our relationships fit a heteronormative ideal. So the consequences of this, if we fail to acknowledge these forms of oppression and marginalization, is that we miss out on the ways that queer loss uh, is taking place in queer lives. And if we miss out on queer loss, then we, we implicitly say, that gay and lesbian lives, bisexual lives, transgender lives aren't as worth living. So what we honor in terms of loss then becomes a, a litmus test for what we have value for in the broader society and what we see. Um, so she says that there's kind of a, a hierarchy of losses in, in society and some get more, more publicly than others. So she gives the example of firefighters being mourned more publicly after 9-11 than uh, janitors. And she says that uh, the same thing happens with queer folks, that heteronormatively, um, hetero lives are mourned more publicly in a sense than queer lives. And uh, so, um, and, and that results in, in queer lives knowing the devastated feeling of hatred and being hated. Um, by showing how queers are a community that's hated, Ahmed hopes to, to then uh, look at the vision that the nation has for itself uh, implicitly. Um, and so uh, she kind of wants to demand recognition of queer ways of grieving. Um, and you might ask yourself if there, there is such a thing or if there's just kind of normal grief for everyone and then uh, if if you don't get a chance to grieve, that's kind of a, a form of uh, oppressed grieving or something like that. Um, so she talks about some ways of refusing, refusing grief, challenging its normative aspects, refusing to let go as kind of an ethical response to loss and a way to keep the dead alive. 
Um, this is kind of high level social theory and it's okay if you don't follow all of it, but maybe you do and it's pretty interesting to you too. Um, she talks about melancholia from uh, as kind of a lost object drawn into the self. So, um, and she says, whatever we, we fail to mourn becomes a lost object that comes into ourself and then um, shapes our very subjectivity. Um, and then again, she mentions the AIDS quilt and she says the AIDS quilt asks the nation to take the grief of this community as their own. Uh, she, Here's a quote from page 161. A queer politics of grief needs to allow others, those whose losses are not recognized by the nation, to have a sphere and time to grieve. Okay, so that kind of summarizes uh, uh, Ahmed's approach right there. Um, we need to recognize others in order to grieve. Um, she talks about Nancy Naples, who's, who was pushed out of her family after her father's death. So sometimes when a loss happens in a family, that becomes a time of reorganization where uh, gay and lesbian folks can be even further marginalized. Um, but it's super important as a pastoral caregiver when people are excluded from the regular everyday networks of legitimation and support um, that you have your eyes and ears open for their forms of loss. Uh, because if you, as a pastoral caregiver, can pay careful attention to the, the losses in the lives of gays and lesbians in your community, then um, you can have a place at the table in terms of advocating for them and um, finding a way to help them grieve. Uh, I would say the more chances people have to allow their public and private lives to match, uh, the, the better their grief prospects are um, and the, the broader their community of support is. But I understand that in some communities, um, grieving out is not always a possibility. Um, some of the most powerful work that I was able to do as a hospice chaplain was uh, helping um, families and uh, gay gay couples uh, to kind of work out how they were going to memorialize uh, their loved one um, and how that was going to be kind of both an official religious process but also a process for the, the queer community. So uh, sometimes there's negotiations that happen after loss, too, where you can find a way to include uh, the voices of the silenced. Um, so Ahmed says uh, heteronormative uh, approaches to love and sexuality are, are harmful for gays and lesbians and bisexual folks, transgender folks, because they push them through narrow categories and they miss the broad range of their lives and their loves. And as a result of that, um, what happens is uh, so much of life's experience uh, gets ungrieved, and uh, because of that lack of an opportunity to grieve, it goes inside, turning into something like melancholia or self-hatred, um, uh, uh, the self turned against the self. And so understanding and liberating um, our views and notions of sexuality then become a gift to our pastoral care and to our approaches to grief more broadly, thus making it more possible for us to grieve, um, and thus, through the process of grieving, honoring lives that, are, that have been silenced and whose experiences have been silenced. Okay, thank you so much for listening, and I'm looking forward to our class together on Monday where we get to discuss this further.